Um, yeah, Sunday night prayer last night, last week was amazing, and I invite you to come along tonight at seven o'clock. Um, there were four words that came out that that stood out, and one of them was healing. Um, that God would be healing our ears, and I'm going to speak a little bit about that today, maybe, because um, they're for hearing, healing, hearing, um, heat. Um, that as in the Old Testament, there was the job of the Levites to keep the, the fire stoked and that we would continue to see the, the presence of God and what he's doing among us, keeping that activity stoked for his glory. So there'd be a, an ongoing heat of what God's doing among us and harvest, um, looking at the fruit of um, what God is doing in our lives and um, being able to give him glory for that, that there's going to be increase in healing, hearing, heat and harvest. Um, and that was wildly encouraging for me this week as I was able to take that into the week and look for what God is doing. Where is God moving in a way of healing among us? Where is God speaking to us? How is he speaking to me? Where um, do we need to play our part to faithfully keep moving forward the things that God is doing among us and looking for the kingdom fruit in this community? It was a frame of reference for my week and um, I encourage you to come along because I believe it will be encouraging for you as well to be found in God's presence in such a way um, to be together to hear him together um, is a beautiful, beautiful gift. And so if you can be here, if you can't, that's okay. Um, that's no dramas as well. We'll kind of try and feed out what God is saying in that environment through our weekly email and through other ways and all of the rest of it. So don't feel like you're missing out if you can't be here, but if you can be, we'd love you to um, join us. Um, before I kick off this morning, I want you to make a mental note of all of the people um, in your life um, throughout your life's journey and particularly um, since coming to faith, who have been people who have helped shape you. Uh, the voices in your life that um, have taught you in the scriptures, um, who have been a voice in your life of godly wisdom, people who have encouraged you along the way when you have felt like you wanted to give up. There's been someone in your corner going, come on, you can do this. You're there. You know, I'm there with you. You know, people who have brought a word of correction in your life, have seen you, you know, heading down a road that is no good for you and have come in and said, hey, pull your head in. As Foster says to me, put a mirror at the end of your bed and wake up to yourself. You know, people in your... Deb just spat her tea out at that one. Uh, <coughs> you know, who are, who are the people who have been so shapely in your life? Uh, even just in, in worship again, I'm, I'm thinking... You know, of my own story that, you know, as far back as I know, which isn't all that far, it started in Sutherland Baptist Church with Norm Naylor, Muzz's dad, um, discipling my dad, and then my dad being Muzz's youth leader, and Muzz's input in my life as a father in my, in, in my life and in my faith has been able to impart. And, and then I was thinking, well, Ru Ruby's Muzz's um, niece, and she's a part of our community here, and I'm just tracking family connections and all of the people and the ways that um, discipleship in my life has looked. And it has looked um, at, like faithful people over many, many years and over many, many times, and I'm sure many, many times on their knees praying for me um, that I am where I am following Jesus in the way that I am today. You know, I'll just make a, make a list. Who are those people? Maybe some of them, you know, they're in this room. Maybe some of them live abroad. Maybe some of them are at their eternal address, eating cheese and bickies on the balcony with Jesus right now. But who are they? Who are those names? Who are those people who have been so influential? I mean, maybe they've only been in your life, maybe, maybe for one encounter. Maybe you met someone just once and, you know, that person was like the angel that flew into your life a gift from God and said the right thing at the right time. You're like, man, if it wasn't for that person, I don't think I'd be here. Maybe it's someone who is in this room that it's, you have an enduring relationship with that has been um, so shapely and formally for you. Have a list of those names. Just see them, visualize them. Hold that person right there front and center. And we're going to give thanks for those people right now. Let's do that. Can we do, can we do that? Can we give thanks for those people? Because I think they deserve our thanks. However you want to do that, take a minute. Just, we can be uncomfortable here. Be silent. Give thanks for those people.
Maybe you need to write that person or those people a letter or send them a text this week. Maybe that would be a cool thing to do. Maybe, maybe give thanks to those people in actual form somehow this week, just to bless them. Hey, thanks for the time where you, or thanks for the, when you stuck it out with me, or thanks for teaching me this. Send, send some gratitude this week to those people. Um, so we're in week two of a series that's kind of been very open-ended since the start of the year. We started in the Psalms and we kicked off with a couple of weeks of um, vision on what it looks to, uh, to hunger and to thirst after God's presence and to hunger and thirst for God's purposes among us. And that was the two weeks at the end of February. And then last week we kicked off what's kind of like the mini-series within the series um, on four focuses that we believe God is calling us to as a church. And these aren't four things that we've just um, pulled out of, plucked out of the sky and gone, hey, these would be great things to do. Um, over um, months at the end of last year, and even going back further than that, continually looking at what God has, his unique fingerprint on us as a church, and what he's doing in us in this current season, and what he's been saying to us um, hearing from people who are interceding for our church, listening to our elders, listening to our ministry teams, listening to kids, listening even in our car park church at the end of November last year, we had a time where we were, um, I was asking some questions around um, the future and your own spiritual growth and these things here. There's been a lot of, um, a, a lot of gathering, filling the basket, if you like, with all kinds of goodies that are helping articulate um, what is it that God would have us focus our effort, our energy, our prayer, our time, our resources, our money, all of that stuff. What is it that God is calling us to and to focus on? And um, I wasn't here last week, but the first one of those was prayer, uh, where Shelley and Ruth led us um, in, a, in a time of prayer last week, which I hear was amazing and incredible if you were here. Um, and so prayer is, is number one, one of these uh, focuses. Um, number two, and we're going to speak on this today, is discipleship, on being well-formed disciples. Uh, the next one we'll speak to next week is local mission. And then the uh, following week in our car park church, it's going to be about kids, uh, young people, kids and youth, that God is calling us to focus on prayer, on discipleship, on local mission and our young people, um, which is pretty cool. I mean, there's other things in there and around that that you know, we'll, we can be giving our time and attention to. But if we're to name the things, that we, the hills that we want to die on, um, in this current season, they are them. That would be people of prayer. That would be people intent on being disciples who make disciples. That would reach out with the love of Jesus in our local community. And that would be empowering other local communities like our Cambodian community within their local context to love their local communities. That local mission would be something that we, we fight hard for. Um, and then our kids and our youth, what God is doing in them as we see them as the future of our church. Um, and so my hope today is that we would um, have a, a, just a heightened sense of our calling to be Matthew 28, 18 to 20 people, people of the Great Commission, for whom you know, Jesus says, you know, I, I give all authority has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything that I have commanded you to do. And remember this, surely I am with you until the very end of the age. You know, there is an overarching mandate that is enduring for God's church. It is that we would be disciples who make disciples. And my hope and prayer would be today that as we, um, as we move forward, that there would be a, a fresh wind in our sails around this, that God would breathe by his Holy Spirit into the sails of this ship and send us forward with, that, um, with a deeper conviction of our place in faith and in community to be disciples who make disciples. In a minute, I'm going to read um, Acts chapter 8 as our framing scripture um, this morning, and I'm um, going to give you eventually eight traits of a church committed to discipleship. Um, and if I if I could, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. I'm shooting from the hip. Um, part of part of the message is getting comfortable being uncomfortable. And as I was preparing uh, this week and into this this morning, um, as I do, I've got heaps of notes. Um, you know that. And um, I, I felt God, uh, and I was about 10 pages deep and a lot of prayer and time this week going into that and um, 
God has said, I want you just to um, summarize um, everything you've kind of prayed through this week. Uh, just unplug that clock up there, would you boys? Just at the actual clock, yep, yeah, good. Does weird things. Um, and God said, I want you to just get a little bit comfortable being uncomfortable and just summarize your message in a few dot points and put it on one page. Um, and so this will be it. Um, shooting from the hip that is born out of, I assure you, plenty of time in prayer and study of the word. This isn't a what to pull a rabbit out of a hat, but it's a God saying, hey, Dave, if you're going to talk about getting a little bit uncomfortable, I think I need you to get a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and I feel heaps more at home when I've got a folder full of notes. Um, but so, uh, as I said, we could go anywhere today and we'll try not to be too long. I did say to somebody uh, this week that I've got nine, nine traits of a church committed discipleship, and they said, you need to edit it. So I got eight. <laughs> and they're not, I'm, this is going to be narrative form. Um, I had dinner last night at a friend's house, and it was Lebanese food. And there was um, lamb koftas, and there was tzatziki, and the garlic dip, and then the, the hummus dip, and then there was halloumi, and what else was there? The, the uh, bright purple pickles, and then there was the pickled chilies, and then there was a bowl of lettuce that you've just got to put a bit of gristle on there just to, you know, eat your greens, um, all of that. And there was, this, there was a spread on the, on the table, and it's, you just kind of look at it, and you're like looking at all of the deliciousness, and you're like, surely I can't possibly put all of this on one wrap. Um, this is kind of um, how I want you to approach as I read the word this morning, is this is a spread. And there may be just one little pot on the table that you're like, I want heaps of that on my wrap at the exclusion of all other things. That's okay. You can have all the garlic dip you want. No one's going to come with near you after, uh, after church. Um, and so there's these eight traits that I will uh, speak through and, and, and speak to as I share some narrative out of Scripture. Um, if there's one that you like, I just need to drill down on that. Take that with you this week and um, eat it. Enjoy it. Chew on it. Stew on it, um, etc. I'm going to read... Um, Acts chapter 8, so if you've got your ESV or your NIV or your NLT or your New King Jimmy, uh, whatever platform of choice you stream the scriptures on, feel free to go there. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 says this, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise! And go toward the south, the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come up to Jerusalem to worship and returning, seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he not, opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And they were going along the road. They came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. And Philip found himself in Azotus, and he passed through and preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Let me pray before we just dive into a few things here. Father, pray that your Holy Spirit um, would breathe upon the word that has been spoken this morning already. 
Father, that your word would go forth from the page and come alive in our hearts. Father, I pray that you would illuminate um, the word that you have for us today. Father, it could be a different word for each person in this room. Uh, Father, pray that whatever that word is, that it would be a deposit in our hearts that would reveal to us more of who you are, reveal to us more of the call that you have on us as followers of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a couple of things that I want to just kind of traverse us through this um, narrative and uh, just pick out and point out um, as we go. And these are going to be our... Actually, let's put them on the screen because I'm going to give you all eight points up the front so you can just follow along at home. Um, is Josh up there? It's called... Da there we go. This is them. This is them. This is where we're going today. So you're not left uh, wondering. And you can take a screenshot and look at it later on. But some context here is that this is Philip, not um, the apostle, uh, but Philip the evangelist. This isn't the Philip that we read of in John chapter 1, um, who we read, uh, Jesus calls him, says, hey, come follow me. And all of a sudden, Philip follows Jesus. We don't get any other um, commentary around that, other than uh, Philip goes and grabs Nathaniel. And Nathaniel um, you know, comes and he follows Jesus as well. This is not that Philip. Um, that Philip in John 1 is the same Philip that was at the feeding of the 5,000 when Jesus said, feed them all. Uh, Philip the Apostle is the one that said, um, but how are we going to do it? There's only a couple of bread rolls and a few little fish. Um, this Philip that we've read of is not that Philip. That was Philip the Apostle. Uh, we are looking at Philip who is called the Evangelist. He is one of the founding fathers of the church. Um, he was chosen as one of seven um, in the story where um, the apostles were too busy to do everything and so they appointed seven others, deacons of the early church, um, who it was their job to um, be all about running around doing ministry things and um, I mean I don't really know exactly what they did but they were doing a bunch of stuff so other people could focus on uh, the ministry of the word and pray. Stephen is one of those seven. Um, what happened in, at about this time um, was that Saul was ravaging the church. As we know, he was persecuting the Christians quite heavily. Um, Stephen was on the, um, got the raw end of the stick um, in that persecution and his life was taken. He preached an absolute cracker of a message. He outlined the, the story of God from beginning to end. He called people to repentance. People came to have faith in Jesus and straight after that, um, all of the bigwigs got pretty upset with him and they threw rocks at him until he died. That was the end of Stephen. Um, that evoked quite a huge amount of persecution, um, fear, worry among the disciples, and so they headed for the hills, Philip being one of them. And he went to a place called Samaria. And this is the story before what I've just read. He's gone to Samaria, north from Jerusalem, 50 kilometers, up to Samaria. And it says in the word up there that they had a very successful mission journey. They saw people get healed of leprosy. They saw lame people who were laying on the side of roads on their mats begging, get up in the name of Jesus and start walking. They saw all kinds of people with infirmities um, get healed and a huge amount of joy erupted in the town of Samaria. I mean, it would have been a, a, a pretty exciting place to be part of. I mean, I get tired after preaching one message here on a Sunday and need to go home for a nap. You know, I can imagine that for these guys who are ministering in the power of the Spirit, um, as the Spirit had just fallen, there would have been so much excitement, so much exuberance. It would have been a dynamic atmosphere. There would have been so much um, hullabaloo around the whole thing. Um, and no doubt, after walking 50 kilometers from home, and then ministering in such a way for we're not quite sure how long, maybe it was a couple of days, maybe it was a couple of weeks. Um, but at some point, Philip was returning home. The job was done and he was walking back to Jerusalem. And it was somewhere along this 50 kilometre walk that the Holy Spirit um, taps him on the shoulder. And he says, hey, Philip, I know you're looking forward to getting home. I know you're looking forward to the clean sheets 
Who loves clean sheets day? That's a wonderful... Slide into bed, clean sheets, nothing better. He was looking forward to the steak and chips. He'd just been probably living on the, um, you know, on the hospitality of, of people. And you know, who knows what the Samaritans were like. Maybe they were tight and they didn't have all that much to give. And he was looking forward to his meal. He was looking forward to a clean shower. He was looking forward to a nap in the hammock on his deck at home. He, was, he just had... He was, I, could, I can see him now as he is walking that 50 kilometres home. He is visualising his me time. You know, you know what I'm talking about? After a big day, a big week, you can visualize, you just take yourself, oh, I can't wait to sit on the lounge and binge some Netflix. I cannot wait um, to whatever your me time is. Philip would have been, I'm assuming, in this place. Pretty tired, pretty exhausted, needing a rest. The Holy Spirit comes upon him and taps him on the shoulder and says, hey, um, Philip, I'm not done with you yet. And he's like, what do you mean? (laughs) He's like, I want you to carry on past Jerusalem. I want you to go um, to the road that is south of Jerusalem that goes um, to, where was it? Gaza. I want you to go towards Gaza. And and Philip's like, yeah, righto, you've got me this far. Surely you'll meet me again. Let's just, let's do this. I'll... I'll do the shower and the clean sheets and the steak and chips later and the cheese and bickies on the deck in the hammock and all of it. I'll park that and, and I'll, I'll go. I'm inconvenienced, Jesus, but I'll go. And at the same time, um, in the same breath, he says, and by the way, this is a desert place. It's like, man, I thought you could have taken me to the seaside. You could have taken me down to the waterfront. You could have taken me back to the Sea of Galilee and a couple of rowboats. We could have gone out, had a relaxing time. But no, I I want you to go further than you were expecting. I want you to to bypass the rest. I want you to bypass the comfort. I want you to bypass what you think you need in this moment. I want you to go further than you would have budgeted your own energy expenditure. Not only that, um, Philip, uh, this is a a desert place. It's it's not like you're not going to find the image of this desert place on the glossy magazines of the must-see to do of the Middle East um, travel magazines. This was a grimy, barren, arid, um, nothing grows there, it is dusty, it is dry. Um, I want you to go to that place. And there's two things that I noticed. I feel like almost that these couple of um, verses at the very beginning of this story are, are the foreword to what God is highlighting for us. It is, it, is the, um, it is the preface to the rest of the story. And it is this, that um, a church that is committed to being a disciple or being disciples who make disciples is that we need to, number one, embrace inconvenient interruptions and we need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I don't know why it is, but it always seems to be the case that when we are on our way somewhere, it is God that interrupts us. It is when we are headed out on a Sunday morning and we know we've got to get to lunch and the Spirit says, hey, I want you to just go and pray for that person. You're like, man, but I've got to get to lunch. Don't you know that I've got a meeting, Jesus? You're like, yeah, I do, but I want you to go and pray for that person. Now, I love, um, I love this, and I, I know they won't like me highlighting this, but Gavin, Gavin and Nat have started leading in our youth ministry. Uh, they get babysitters for their five kids on a Friday night so they can be here to, to be among our young people. I mean, you want to talk about being inconvenienced and having your schedule disrupted to the point where you would need to organise a military-style operation, a commercial-grade operation, so that you can free yourselves up, not just to look after your own tribe of five kids, but come and be found here feeding both physically and spiritually kids who aren't your own. I mean, there is an interruption to a family system. I mean, if we're going to be fair income about discipling the next generation, we need to be pe- people who are prepared for God to tap us on the shoulder and say, I want you to go further than what you thought you were going to. To be prepared to, to embrace the interruptions and the inconveniences of God. I mean, it's hard to do, right? We have all kinds of excuses. We have all kinds of things going on. But this is something that needs to be true of us as a church. People who are willing to say yes to Jesus, even though it's going to cost us, that we embrace inconvenient interruptions. 
And we get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. This is a church that does uncomfortable well. I feel like this is not a hesitant bunch. This, sometimes it's kind of like, oh, I don't know about that, and a bit, a bit about this. By and large, we're pretty good at change. We're pretty good at adaptability. We're pretty good at being flexible. We're pretty good at going with the flow. We're pretty good at not following the rules. We're pretty good at all of, you know, being pretty flexible and pretty, pretty out of our comfort zone. You know, this week it made me, this made me think back to the days where we had the frog crew running from 2006 to about 2017-ish, about 10 or 11 years. And every Friday and every Saturday night, we had teams of people from our church, from young adults through the old people like Donna. Uh, <laughs> love you, Dee. Um, and every Friday and Saturday night, we would have a team of four, five, or six people um, on the streets of Cronulla. In our ute was first, we had our ute, and then we had our bus and a trailer. And every Friday and every Saturday night for about 10 years, a, a, quite a long time, we had people in the heart of Cronulla after the Cronulla riots being found among the young people of our community who were um, getting up to all kinds of mischief, drug and alcohol related issues, violence issues. And we would be a listening ear giving out free red frogs, bottles of water. When kids got too drunk and couldn't make their way home, we'd doof them in the bus take them home, wait for the light to come on out the front and mum and dad's face to go, and then we drive off. Um, all that kind of stuff. And there was, and I can tell you now, and it's like, oh, it sounds like really exciting and really fun. Um, but being in the middle of Cronulla Mall, in the middle of winter, when it's raining and when it's pouring, and you've got a young person coming for a red frog, but more than that, they, they were coming to um, share with us some of um, life's most complex and difficult situations. Some of the stories that we heard and the things we were invited into, uh, the moments where the police would call us and say, hey, can you come and sit with this young person uh, because of X, Y, Z? Uh, that was not comfortable, inglorious, in fact. And discipleship is not sexy. You know, sometimes discipleship was never meant to be comfortable. It was never meant to be cozy. It was never meant to be something that pins people up onto a pedestal and goes, how amazing is it to be a disciple maker? They earn heaps of money. They wear all the best stuff. They've got the best car and all the rest of it. Being someone who is committed to discipleship means being comfortable being uncomfortable. Where we aren't placing ourselves in the middle of the story or the limelight, but we place Jesus in the middle of the story and in the middle of the limelight. And we are okay. And I know that this church has cut its teeth in on the front lines of discomfort. And I don't feel like that's going to change. And I can't apologize for that. I think God is going to be perpetually calling us into uncomfortable places with uncomfortable people in order that we would be able to fulfill the Great Commission as Philip did with this Ethiopian eunuch gentleman. So when the Spirit says, go further, and the Spirit says, go to the desert, we shouldn't be surprised because he's calling us to inconvenient interruptions and we need to be people that embrace them. And he's calling us to the desert place, places that are uncomfortable, places that are arid, places that are barren, not so that we could just set up tents there, so we could bring the life of the kingdom into places that are arid and into the places that are barren. We don't get a huge amount of commentary other than this, that Philip, verse 27, arose and went. I mean, I love the simplicity of this encounter. You know, spirit comes, spirit falls, spirit prompts, taps him on the shoulder, hey, I want you to go. Um, and this is where it is, and that's all I'm giving you. I want you to go, and this is where it is. And, and Philip just responded to the simple voice of God. And sometimes I think we overcomplicate God's voice, and we wonder why we can't hear him. And sometimes he speaks in just the still and the small way that just confounds all wisdom. You know, we think we're waiting for the heavens to open and the dove to fall. Hey, Dave! With an echo like that. You know, it is in the simple and small voice and responding to that in obedience that I think, I think, um, will be a way that we move forward as a church into seeing disciple, being disciples who make disciples. Because no doubt, and I, I, I have to have, this is a base level assumption, that when we get together as a community, the Holy Spirit is talking to you for other people. People who are in this room, people who are not in this room. 
And what we choose to do with that still small voice can be, and I don't want to take away from the sovereignty of God, nor his ability to use other people when we are so hard, hard, hard of heart and say no, um, but I wonder what would have come of the Ethiopian eunuch if Philip had have said no. No, I'm going home instead. I don't want to go the extra, I'm just going, I'm, I'm done. I'm going, I'm going back to home. I'm not going to that road. I'm not going to the desert. What may have come, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't want to know. I don't want to be the person that finds out. You know, I want to be someone and I endeavor to be someone who can hear the still small voice of God and respond in the simple obedience. And sometimes I got, I need, I got it clipped over the ears by God last week on this and I was with Greg. We were away last weekend and um, I told this story on Sunday night last, night, uh, last week. If you were here, I apologize. You're going to hear it twice. Um, but this was something that I needed to hear. I needed to hear the still small voice of God and obey it because I think I had clouded, I think I had com, com, made God's voice too complex in my life. Looking in places where I'm like, God, surely you're speaking here. He's, no, Dave, just listen, the still small voice. And we're heading off to go away and um, I was going to um, pack my Christian surface t-shirt um, to wear on the Sunday. We only went away for Saturday and Sunday and I was packing for, I thought I'd put this shirt in for Sunday. And as I'm standing at my wardrobe, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Dave, I want you to wear that shirt tomorrow. You're going to meet someone in Terrigal. That's where we're going. We're going to Terrigal. I'm like, whatever. Um, cool. I, I will not wear the shirt on Sunday. I'll, put it in, uh, I'll wear it today when we left. And so I put it on and off we go. And we've been for a walk. We've been to the beach and got some lunch and all the rest of it. Um, the girls have stopped to do a little bit of um, window shopping at some clothes racks and Greg and I didn't hang around for that activity. Um, we got, I moseyed on down the, the beachfront um, strip if you've been to Terrigal there, just the, 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 the cafes and whatnot. And um, a guy comes out of the um, shadows. Sounds more dramatic than what it was. Uh, but he says, um, hey, um, excuse me, are you Dave from Kingsway? <laughs> and I was kind of like, uh... Um, what have you heard? <laughs> um, I said, yeah. Um, he's like, I was just on the Christian Surfers website this morning and I was looking at the national gathering that's happening in, at Easter down in Tasmania and I'm, I'm speaking at that. Um, so I'm not here for Easter, sorry. Um, I'm the speaker across the weekend and so they've got my face on the website of the Christian Surfers. And he said, I was just on the Christian Surfers website umming and ahhing whether I should go to the national gathering and take my boys with me. And here you are like in Terrigal, like what is, what is going on? And I walked away and, and you know, we had a brief chat and um, whatnot and we walked away and, and, you know, thinking, oh, that was cool. But then I just thought, no, this is it. This is the, Dave, don't over complexify, if that's a word, the voice of God. You know, he wants to speak to us in the very clear and simple ways. And I think this was a word from last Sunday night, return to us the joy of hearing the simple voice of God. And I think this is a work that God is doing. We talked about healing our hearing. That I think God is up to this in the church, that he is opening our ears to the still, small voice. And he is calling you and I to a deeper level of obedience to that still, small voice. And it's going to look like small moments. It's going to look like big moments. But it's not up to us with the outcome. We listen to the Spirit and we respond and we trust God with what happens next. And if we're going to be a church that, of disciples who make disciples, we need to respond to the still small voice. As Philip's walking the road, kind of waiting to see what would happen, I'm, because there would have been a time where there was nothing. There was no chariot. There was just the blazing sun and his own company. He's walking the road with Pat Malone. And uh, he's... You know, what am I here for? And then out of the corner of eye, he, he notices a chariot trotting its way down the, the dirt road. And, and the spirit says, I want you to go over, go over to him. He's the one, go, 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 go. And Philip, he starts running and he's chasing down the chariot. He's at full clip, you know, hoik up the whatever he's wearing and boom, off he goes. Like a bull at a gate, he chases this thing down. And as the chariot's still clopping along, he's running alongside. And I can't run and talk at the same time, but apparently Philip can. I think it's a spiritual gift. If you go for a run and can talk to your friend, you're doing well. Anyway, he's huffing and he's puffing. And out of the corner of his ear, he can just hear this um, African um, Ethiopian gentleman reading Isaiah. And he's hearing him going, what is going on? This guy's trotting along in a chariot. He's reading the Bible out loud. And he sides up next to him and says, hey, hey, buddy. Do you know what you're reading? And the guy in the chariot looks down at Philip as he's 
running along, break into a big sweat. He's like, hey, what do you mean do I know what I'm reading? How on earth am I going to know what I'm reading unless somebody comes and tells me what it's about? And uh, the old mate in the chariot says, why don't you hop on in? Come on up into my chariot. And uh, so Philip, I don't know whether they slowed down, I don't know what happened, but Philip ends up in the chariot. As we know, Philip can just mysteriously disappear and arrive in other places. Maybe the spirit just, whoop, in he goes. Um, either way, uh, Philip ends up in the chariot sitting alongside this man who was very different to him. I mean, this, this eunuch, he had been um, rejected in Jerusalem. Um, on the basis of being a eunuch, um, you have your, uh, brace yourselves, people, his genitals removed. Um, and this was the, the definition of a eunuch, and uh, for many reasons, and we're not going to go into that, but um, something in Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, that precludes you from being um, able to be in God's presence, to be able to attend the temple, even the outer courts of the temple. If you um, have had that operation done, then you are not allowed in God's courts. And so the chariot, the Ethiopian eunuch had made a 3,000 mile journey to, uh, from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to be rejected. You know, he was a different, he was from a different place um, to Philip. He looked very different to Philip. Um, he was of a different social class to Philip. He was a wealthy man in charge of the entire treasury of the queen of Ethiopia. Uh, Philip was just a a Jewish pleb who's running, running errands for Jesus these days. He's of a completely different place and people to this guy, which again speaks to that we need to get uncomfortable being, get comfortable being uncomfortable because I can imagine as Philip got in there, he's like, Ugh, what do we have in common? Where do we even go here? It would have been a pretty awkward beginning. But we get to this point where he starts sharing the gospel with him as he is sitting in a very unfamiliar place a very unfamiliar chariot with a very unfamiliar person. And I think we need to be willing to be in unfamiliar chariots with people who don't look like us, people who don't believe like us, people who don't um, subscribe to the same worldview as us, people who have questions that are beyond us, uh, with people who um, we feel like we may be too old to connect with, uh, be found in, in unfamiliar places where we may be like, oh, I did that years ago. That, that's not me anymore. Yeah, you know, I think there is a call for us to be found in unfamiliar places with unfamiliar people in order that we can bring Jesus into their lives. Because God is already at work, as we see in this eunuch, where there's a partnership that Philip is doing with God in the moment. That God, had already, God is already at work in this gentleman and Philip sides up alongside him in an unfamiliar place with an unfamiliar person and continues what God is already at work doing in his life. And it got me thinking about our church. I mean, we've got, we've got chariots in this church that are full of young people. You know, the, the ark out the back here with our kids that are like two years old through to primary school age, like five years old. I mean, that's one big chariot in there full of a whole bunch of wonderful kids who we're not just babysitting. It's not just put them in there so we can be in here. You know, that is a chariot in which there are young people with inquisitive minds saying, how on earth will I know unless somebody explains this to me? And we are Phillips in this church who are running the race of faith being ready to be inconvenienced, to get uncomfortable, to be found in an unfamiliar place. And maybe the Spirit of the Lord is tapping you on the shoulder and saying, hey, I want you to go and get in the chariot of our kids and help answer their questions. I mean, our Radiate program upstairs for our primary age kids from kindergarten through to year six. I mean, this is the most formative, some of the most formative times of a young mind. And we know this from data when it comes to kids and their faith in Jesus and the impact that has on families and generations to come. There is a chariot upstairs here that is full of young lives who are asking questions, who are needing understanding. And perhaps the Spirit of God is tapping you like he tapped Philip on the road and said, I want you to go. I want you to get into that chariot. 
I want you to help them understand what I am doing in their lives. I want you to help them understand what my word says. I want you to help them understand the, the vitality and the life and the exuberance of my kingdom as a gathered community. I mean, Friday nights, it is a raucous chariot. I was here, I've been here the last couple of Friday nights and these guys know how to have fun and go deep in the things of the Lord and get serious um, in, in, in the word together in praying for one another, in ministering to each one another in the Spirit. It is a chariot full of God's kingdom. It is a microcosm we see of what God is doing in the lives of young people that is going to be, as I've said, the future of our church. And maybe you're going, oh no, I'm too old, I can't. I did that. I did youth when I was in my 20s. Like, I'm too, I can't connect with a young person. They're too smelly and... Not you guys, I'm talking about the boys. Boys smell up there uh, and, and we can easily start making excuses for why we don't get in the chariot friends I think God is asking us to get in chariots I wonder which one it is and it might not it might be with plenty more there's chariots in your life in your workplace there are chariots people in chariots who are asking big questions will you get into an unfamiliar chariot I'm going to finish up real quickly because I've noticed the time and I promised I wouldn't go so long um, is this, is that Philip gets in and, and he asks a question. Do you understand what you're reading? And this is a, a cultural thing, I think, for what it means to be a church of disciples that makes disciples, is that we lead with curiosity, not with our opinion. You know, Philip didn't get in and just start ranting and raving about his bent on Jesus, but he asked a simple question. And I think that is a call on us to lead with curiosity, not with our opinion. Lead with questions rather than our answers. Lead um, with, with, with a, you know, cu- uh, curiosity l- uh, builds trust. And trust builds relationships and relationships are the context in which discipleship happens. And so even among, practice this among yourselves. Here is some homework. Lead with curiosity. On a Sunday morning when we turn up, what's God been saying to you this week? What have you been, what are you been reading? How are you, how are you going? Rather than... Uh, you know, coming in, and we don't, we don't do this. We don't come in, you know, all hot and heavy, over the top, and being aggressive with our thoughts and our opinions and our beliefs. And I want to continue to encourage that, that we are to lead with curiosity like Philip led with curiosity. And we see in this that Philip, he didn't lead with his own ideas, but he spoke Jesus. He led him through the gospel. He gave him the good news of the gospel. And discipleship is not discipleship unless Jesus is at the center of it. And so, friends, when you find yourselves in environments where you are discipling somebody, don't disciple them around your ideas. Don't disciple them around what you've read on Facebook. Don't disciple them on the latest Joyce Meyer message or the latest Joseph Prince or the latest whatever it might be, um, which might all be good you know, stuff for your soul. We don't disciple things in the ideas of man. We disciple people in the ideas of Jesus. We disciple people in the life of Jesus. We disciple people in the ways of the Spirit. We disciple them. We give people Jesus. And the last two, really quick, is I love that um, Philip just didn't listen to any of the religious barriers that were probably flying around in his head. As we know, the eunuch was rejected from Jerusalem on the grounds of his sexuality, his social standing, um, etc. He said, no, you're not welcome here. And so all of those things still would have been flying around in Philip's mind as a Jewish man as to why he should not be included in God's kingdom. But when this man said, hey, there's some water over there, Can I get, what's stopping me getting baptised? There would have been an instantaneous moment, I'm sure, in Philip's humanity where he's rolling through all of the reasons why not to be able to baptise this guy and instead he silences all of those religious barriers and says, nah, let's get in. You know, if we're going to be a church of disciples who make disciples, I think we need to ignore the religious barriers that have been there in the past. For all of the reasons why we think someone ought to be excluded, I think God is going to confront that. And it's probably going to hurt our pride and probably confront some tradition and all of the rest of it. Now, I'm not saying we throw the baby out with the bathwater and get unorthodox in our belief. Don't hear that one bit. Um, but in terms of what means someone is eligible to be loved by God and to be welcomed into his kingdom based on their their gender, their sexuality, their social standing, their position in life, all of these things. I think if we have barriers, I think that God is going to, we're going to be limited in how we be a discipling church. So God needs us to ignore the religious barriers that we may have inherited in order that people would step into his kingdom. 
And lastly, I love that Philip got whisked away by the Spirit and had nothing else to do with this guy again. And it just tells us that we need to be people who are going to play their part you know, Paul talks about it. You know, I know, you know, Polos waters and the other bloke puts seeds in and the other guy harvests the fruit, where, however it works, I can't remember, probably should. Um, but he, kn- he knew his part. He knew his part. And we can't do everything. You can't do everything. I can't do everything. We all, this is a body. This is a ministry of the body together and we all need to play our part. Philip knew his part and he played it faithfully. And that looked like responding to Jesus even though it was inconvenient, even though it made him uncomfortable. He responded with simple obedience to the clear and simple voice of God. He was willing to get into in unfamiliarity, into somewhere uncomfortable that he wasn't sure of, but yet God met him there anyway. He led with curiosity. He spoke the gospel. He was willing to ignore religious barriers and play his part in the process. There are eight traits of a church who are disciples, who will make disciples. And friends, I want you to take this and I want you to sit with this and I want you to ask God, where do you need to grow me in this? Because this is how the kingdom moves. It moves from life to life. Not from room to room, from life to life. And we, if we're going to be Matthew 28, 18 to 20 people who go into all of the world to make disciples of all of the nations and all of the people in our lives, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit and teaching them everything Jesus commanded. We need to do this stuff. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have been among us this morning. Thank you that you are here. Thank you that you speak through your word. Thank you that you um, are so present to encourage us and to inspire us. Father, I pray that you would take what we have um, seen from your word this morning and that you would bring it to light, bring it to life, that you would um, place your finger on the parts of this that we need to grow in, that we need to pray more into, that, Father, at the end of all of this, that your name would be glorified because we are living out your mission to see disciples made for your name and for your glory. And so, Father, may this be a a moment that we take, a moment that we don't underrate or underappreciate, but that we take forward into the future and recognize, God, there's a moment that you stirred us, stirred our hearts, tapped us on the shoulder and asked us to go. So, Father, may you speak in your simple, clear voice to us. Open our ears to where you're leading us and taking us and to the people that you are calling us to. In Jesus' name, amen.